Hello everybody, uh, greetings from Threadneedle Street uh, here in downtown London. Some of you might recognize the Bank of England behind me. Um, and um, the reason I'm doing this video standing here is because in my book, uh, The Great Transition, The Personalization of Finance is here, uh, I say that uh, innovation in finance ever only takes place in times of crisis. And there is no better example than the Bank of England itself uh, because uh, it, was a, it was an institution created by the British Crown or the English royalty uh, at a time in, in the late 1600s, 1690, whatever, okay, uh, to, uh, to be a bank of last resort uh, as they had to borrow a lot of money uh, to fund the war against uh, France. Um, and that's uh, the reason why a central bank uh, was created. Uh, and the Americans put, it, put off the idea of uh, creating a similar bank of last resort uh, uh, for as long as they could because they wanted so much in the history of America from the time it was independent. They wanted so much not to recreate uh, the institutions uh, that uh, were established in the UK, like the Bank of England. So the Federal Reserve Banking System was finally created in 19, oh, 1912, I think, uh, because of a uh, banking crisis in the US in 1907. So, um, so what I say in my book is that if you want to see breakthroughs in you know, innovations in finance, always wait for a time of crisis. Uh, and it's out of absolute desperation uh, that a new breakthrough takes place um, and a new institution gets created that defines finance for a long time to come. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the foreword to my book was written by Barney Frank, uh, who was a congressman who co-authored the Dodd-Frank Act, uh, which was also uh, the result of a crisis uh, that take, took place in 2007 and 2008, the, the great American uh, banking crisis. Um, the purpose of doing this video uh, is to continue from uh, the previous video uh, where I had made some comments on China and, uh, and I had got very interesting responses uh, from which I can build uh, a number of uh, important first principles uh, in how we assess uh, financial institutions, financial systems. Um, the first thing I want to say is that I had made this comment that uh, China uh, is a very transparent country uh, on the economic front. Uh, and I think that took a few of uh, my viewers uh, off guard uh, and, and uh, made them question, really, China, transparent? Um, and I want to make a distinction here that China is not transparent on the governance front, but it is very transparent on the economic front, okay? Uh, and nothing exemplifies that more than, uh, the, uh, than the two sessions that were held uh, just last week. And I want to make some comments on, on, the, on, the, on the two sessions. Uh, or in Chinese, they call it Liang Hui, meaning Liang Ke Hui Yi, uh, two sessions, uh, two meetings, uh, a, a, a direct uh, translation. Um, I, I was able to read um, a couple of the uh, proposals made uh, during the two sessions and uh, very, very interesting uh, insights uh, into uh, what I think uh, will happen in terms of how China will respond uh, to some of the issues that it's confronted with today. So I want to talk about three things about from the Liang Hui. Uh, the first thing is this. I think that I see uh, a process by which China will work itself out uh, from its uh, uh, property uh, crisis uh, that is undergoing today. And uh, this is how uh, I, I have uh, evolved my thinking uh, on, on how China will work uh, its way through. Um, now, I want to say at this point that I'm not a vlogger, okay? Uh, I like doing interesting things, uh, but I don't, um, you know, survive on uh, the number of likes on my uh, website or my blog page and so on. Um, I do run a business where I advise um, clients um, and venture capitalists uh, on how to think about um, trends and how to make decisions on the frontiers of finance uh, and also which uh, decisions on issues that go into geopolitics uh, and how entire countries and social systems uh, evolve. Uh, my first principles are always from the finance industry and then building out. Uh, so in that regard, 
uh, my real profession is one of a futurist working with uh, corporate clients uh, in their decision making process. Uh, so I don't, uh, um, you know, I, I, I'm not out to uh, uh, build a point of view uh, or a bias, uh, but in fact, it's very important that I remain as neutral as possible. So now, the three things that I wanted to point out from the uh, the, the two, two sessions that were held. Uh, the first thing um, is that it made me uh, feel incredibly gratified that I think that China will work out uh, a, a way out of its uh, current property-driven uh, or property-based crisis. Um, it's like this. Um, oh, someone wrote, one of the representatives in the legislature uh, wrote a paper and submitted it for discussion in one of the subcommittees. And I wrote, I read uh, a little bit of that paper. And, and this is what he said. He said, uh, the thing for China to do is to give property rights uh, to uh, the rural community. Uh, property rights in the urban community were introduced by Tu Rongji when he was premier. Uh, and uh, I think it was in the 1990s uh, and that gave rise to the property boom that we see in China and the fact that um, you know property ownership uh, is a, a predominant form of wealth creation uh, in the urban areas uh, so the paper that was presented at this year's um, um, you know uh, two sessions uh, suggested that to extend property rights uh, to the rural community now, uh, when I read the paper, I went out and I did some uh, research uh, on the profile of property ownership uh, and uh, the rural urban migration in China. And this is what I found. Um, China is the one country and maybe one uh, important developed country where uh, the urban wealth creation uh, is probably the most well spread out. So if you take um, the, the major cities in GDP terms, uh, the largest city in GDP terms in China is Shanghai, and it accounts for about 3.8% um, of GDP. And then after Shanghai comes three cities, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, uh, and Beijing, uh, who each uh, account for between 1% and 3%, 1% and 2%, something like that. Um, and then comes the second tier of the cities, uh, everything from Xi'an to uh, Chengdu to Chongqing, um, and all of them account for between 0.5 to 1% of GDP. Now, uh, there are many countries, uh, Korea for example, Seoul accounts for between 20 and 30% of GDP. I mean, it's, uh, it's extensive. Bangkok, uh, 30 and 40% of GDP. When a, when a country's major city accounts for such a large percentage of GDP, um, it actually renders the rest of the country um, unable to uh, create um, wealth and, uh, and uh, engender uh, a livable community, uh, engender jobs, engender um, uh, investable assets like property um, and, and community and all of that. Um, the U.S. and some of the better developed countries um, have also got a pretty good distribution. So uh, the U.S., uh, New York uh, accounts for about 8.6% uh, of GDP, something in that range. Um, and then comes um, Los Angeles, which is half of that, about 4%, uh, and then Washington, D.C., and so on. So it's not in the 10%, but um, still much twice the size uh, of the largest uh, Chinese cities. And China is still um, about 60-odd percent urbanized, uh, whereas an average uh, Western country uh, like the UK or the US is like 80 to 90 percent urbanized. So there's a lot of urbanization that can still happen in China. Um, and then when you look at um, what's yet to be uh, built on uh, is this um, rural urban migration and so the, the proposal that is in the um, uh, Liang Hui uh, is that uh, by giving rural people uh, property ownership uh, you actually enable them uh, to create wealth which they then can transfer as they move into the urban areas 
so you sell your property and then you buy something in a more urban setting and it doesn't need to be a Shanghai or a Beijing uh, it can be a third tier city uh, but uh, which raises income uh, it raises prospects for employment and, and so on um, because uh, that rural urban migration uh, doesn't come with uh, wealth creation uh, today um, you see a lot of the um, urban migrants in the major cities um, unable to uh, build wealth of their own um, and of course uh, tied to that uh, is the fact that the numbers that I just gave you, uh, you know, 3.8% uh, uh, Shanghai being, um, um, uh, you know, a, a, as a percentage of the GDP does not take into account uh, the contribution uh, of the population that does not have a hukou, uh in the urban areas. And so um, there is uh, proposals in the system uh, to get rid of the Kuko system as well. Um, now, the question then is, at which point uh, will the government uh, take into consideration these proposals and start to um, incorporate them uh, into policy? Now, here, the Chinese government is driven very much by ideology uh, of, of socialism, which is that um, the rural communities are the bedrock of support uh, or political support and let me tell you it's the same in every major country Japan the rural community the farmers are the bedrock of uh, the political system um, and and the Midwest in the US and so on so um, um, to give them property rights uh, will then create the unintended consequence of being accountable to them even more um, and, and creates a different dynamics in a political system um, what's interesting is just like uh, the creation of the central bank in, in the UK or in England, uh, such transitions come uh, into being. In other words, governments finally make those transitions in times of crisis. Okay? Now, uh, the second thing that I want to say that comes out of the meeting that I observed uh, is the empowerment of the uh, of the um, provincial governments. I was looking for uh, indications that the central government will allow the provincial governments to generate their own income, uh, much more than they were able to in the past. Uh, one of the reasons for the property crisis was that uh, sale of land was one of the major, if not the most important uh, generator of uh, profits uh, and of income for provincial government to be able to run their everyday work and also to meet the KPIs uh, that were set by uh, the central government. Uh, in fact, um, there's, an, there's an economist in China that I uh, respect very much, uh, Jin Ke Yi, uh, who is the daughter uh, of uh, another economist uh, who served uh, in Chu Ronti's time, I think, uh, and and so she's he was also very highly respected, and then and she is today, and she just came up with a book, uh, the New China Playbook, and um, and she outlined how the uh, distribution of uh, national resources is distributed uh, through uh, the provincial and local governments, the mayors, and so on. Um, now, um, I must say that the provincial governments in China have a very narrow band of income stream okay and they and this year's uh, two meetings showed me that uh, that narrow band hasn't been lifted yet uh, hasn't been broadened yet okay um, besides uh, sale of property uh, they have as a source of income um, funding from the national government for strategic projects uh, and also funding from the national government for uh, for selected industries uh, subsidies for sub selected industries uh, and in this year's meeting uh, they've been encouraged to go out and look for foreign investment as well and I've spoken with pretty senior people uh, in <coughs> the provincial governments uh, in certain cities okay uh, where you know in, in a five-minute meeting I'm asked what I can do to bring foreigners uh, and foreign investment even in things like uh, microchip industry into uh, the city um, and so the provincial governments are desperately looking for foreign investors uh, and you know that what they will end up doing 
is to discuss with the local uh, immigration departments to see how they can expedite uh, immigration requirements for foreigners who want to start businesses in China uh, and, and who want to invest in China uh, and also who want to work in China but uh, work in a way that brings um, you know, uh, new skills and new investments into China. So right now, all the focus is on AI, AI, okay, AI. That's what the central government is saying. So you can be sure that what's going to happen is every major city is going to have an AI initiative. Now, China is a little different from uh, other countries that uh, have uh, national subsidies distributed to the system. In the US, they are actually distributed immediately to uh, the corporations at the national level by the federal government. Um, in Japan, uh, the distribution is through, um, through companies or quasi-state, uh, quasi quasi-private sector uh, entities. Uh, entities such as SBI in Japan, for example, which gets a uh, lion's share uh, of the funding for innovation. And in areas like um, quantum computing, space exploration, uh, where uh, there are frontier territories and where the, the state allows the private sector to de determine uh, where that funding should go um, and, uh, and make those commercial decisions as opposed to China where it gives the money to the provincial governments who then go out and curate thousands of companies uh, to, uh, you know, to receive the funding if they are domiciled in the city and bring value to the city and so on. Now what that ends up doing um, is that it creates an uh, incredible amount of um, bandwidth uh, and incredible amount of players uh, in each ecosystem. Uh, in fact, it, it creates an overcapacity. Um, in fact, uh, uh, this economist uh, Jin Keiyi mentioned that in, in areas like um, uh, EV, for example, electronic electric vehicles, uh, there are cities that are not even players in uh, EV technology, which have thousands, uh, 9,000 uh, small companies uh, that are doing innovation in uh, uh, or, or you know claiming these subsidies uh, in order to do innovations uh, in EV technology. Now, overcapacity does create competition, um, and it's nothing unusual. Unlike uh, the American system, for example, when um, Henry Ford created. Uh, the Model T and the assembly line, um, within 20 years, um, what happened was the America had about 2,000 uh, car manufacturers, okay, right into the 1920s. Uh, and then eventually they start to consolidate uh, into three um, players. Now, while I said that uh, China is incredibly transparent, uh, in its um, uh, in its economic policy, um, there is very little. Okay, I must also say that there is very little going back to examine policies uh, and uh, and critiquing them um, after they're implemented. Okay, so if you take a high speed railway, for example, it was in the uh, you know the two sessions uh, um, gathering. Uh, in 2007 or 2008 um, and it came out as a policy paper that we will pursue high-speed railway and we will buy that technology rather than create it ourselves. It was a decision made at that point in time and today China has 40,000 kilometers of high-speed railway. Okay, um, Now, and then when you look at 5G for example, uh, you know, the newspapers talk about, you know, China has aced um, the US in 5G technology and so on. But there is criticism from within the system. In fact, it was a former Minister of Finance, uh, Lo Ji Wei, um, a former Minister of Finance who, who in a paper uh, presented at a meeting uh, outside of the, you know, the, uh, the, the two, uh, two sessions, um, where he said that China had over-invested in 5G technology. Uh, and as it turns out, uh, the real application of 5G technology is in manufacturing inside the factories and not uh, as a common public good uh, because there are not enough applications in 5G technology. Um, and in a way, the infrastructure had to be invested in, um, you know, in commensurate with the applications that are developing uh, so that it would be commercially viable. 
So we are also, uh, you know, dealing with an overhang uh, in 5G technology uh, in China, and that will soon um, change to 6G and you know other developments. And in fact, if you think about it, um, while China was uh, you know, uh, being complimented on building incredible 5G technology, AI came into force um, and uh, OpenAI uh, made it very clear that it would need $7 trillion worth of uh, infrastructure to set out the servers to make um, AGI, uh, Artificial General Intelligence, um, uh, available uh, around the world, uh, ubiquitous around the world. Um, so, so even as the infrastructure for 5G was being set up, uh, new infrastructure requirements have come out. Now, those of you who keep saying that you know the future will belongs to China and China will be the um, you know will beat the US and so on, um, it's very important to know your enemy. Okay, um, there are many things that are wrong about the US. Okay, the, the US is. Um, is, uh, is a very difficult country, uh, it's a very rough country and so on. And the reason it's a rough country is because the capital markets are brutal. Okay, they, they reward uh, the companies that do well, but they also punish uh, the ones that can't keep up. And, and then you get uh, joblessness on the streets, uh, homelessness uh, and so on. And, uh, and a country like the US is willing to accept that um, as part of the uh, social psyche uh, in pursuit of the, the discipline um, of capitalism. Okay, and, and a country like China wants to moderate that okay? and, and say that um, you know, we don't need excessive cap capitalism, let the state be the one that uh, decides um, you know, what needs to be invested in, to what extent, uh, and, and to bring uh, common good to everybody. So, um, so 5G, to be honest, um, there's an overhang there. And then guess what? In the EV technology, there's also an overhang coming, uh, coming on stream. Now the EV overhang is because uh, too many companies in China are pursuing EVs and finding it very easy to enter the industry because there's a lot of subsidies in, uh, available uh, for um, you know um, you know taking part in the EV industry and and the same thing for uh, electric uh, batteries and and so on. Um, now uh, with the overhang. Uh, there comes a point where there's a need for consolidation in the industry and the consolidation can be brutal and the consolidation is nothing unusual okay so please don't say that i'm saying all this to criticize china i'm saying all this uh, because um, both governments and the private sector have to decide uh, how much is enough uh, and how much infrastructure is enough um, and at which point does an industry um, you know, tend into overcapacity and so on. So the third point that I want to uh, talk about uh, is how China is going to fund uh, its uh, new economic model as it evolves. So the state uh, funding uh, or selecting industries and then funding them uh, through subsidies um, has um, a lot of uh, wastage in there um, and the way to deal with the wastage is to be absolutely transparent uh, when there's an overcapacity and allow companies to fail. Uh, so this is the capitalist model. Now if you don't allow companies to fail, um, you will then need to figure out how to repurpose them. Okay. Now, none of this is to suggest that there will not be breakthroughs in technology. Uh, in fact, Jin Kei says this, that uh, you can make breakthroughs in any technology you want uh, as long as you throw money at it. Okay, if you throw money, you can solve problems. Um, um, and uh, then the question is, uh, how much money uh, should you be throwing uh, at a problem? So. Remember, in the previous video, I said there are three, uh, um, it, there are three pillars uh, of economic um, structure in China. One is the state and the state-owned enterprises. The middle uh, are the private sector manufacturing companies, the, the run-of-the-mill uh, industries uh, and private sector industries. And the third uh, are the uh, dot-com or the digital industries 
that were essentially funded by American money. So I think I said this in my previous video that uh, Alibaba, for example, today is $198 billion. So it's come down so much. And when it comes down, that pillar um, loses its effectiveness uh, to fund uh, or rather to be participating in the economy. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so then what are you going to replace that with? Um, the state is uh, subsidizing a lot of that. So whenever you see the Chinese stock market doing well, you can be sure uh, it's because the state is, uh, is supporting the market uh, in order that it holds its valuations and so on, the domestic market. Okay, as for the Chinese companies that are listed abroad, uh, you are actually getting a real-time feed uh, of what um, the global uh, investor base thinks of these assets. Okay? They can be good and they can be bad, uh, but right now the global investment um, uh, sentiment on Chinese assets uh, is not very favorable, uh, but um, you know, it, it will work its way through over time. Um, my own assessment is that uh, countries are able to fund um, continued growth uh, actually much longer than we realize. In other words, um, an economic downturn does not necessarily mean that the country's ability to fund uh, and subsidize um, selected industries to, uh, to provide social uh, safety nets and so on um, goes into remission. Um, you know, Japan is a very good example. For 30 years, uh, the funding was entirely domestic. You know, it wasn't a, a, a darling of the global investment uh, community for many, many years. Okay, and yet it survived. Um, and it's also a function of uh, how the state creates domestic currency liquidity uh, and uh, and then keeps it. Uh, keeps the integrity of their liquidity by making sure that it manages its fiscal and monetary policies uh, very well. And China has got incredible skills in that area. So I, I don't see um, you know, China not being able to manage its own domestic funding base well. Um, except that um, you know, the sparkles of um, a well-capitalized uh, innovation company, uh, that's something that uh, uh, China will be able to struggle with. Now, from just this presentation alone, from this um, session, I have a number of other points to raise, but I, do, I would not want to discuss them immediately here. I will create other videos. Uh, give me your feedback. Um, I am interested to know your feedback. Uh, I'm interested to know, you know, what I'm blindsided on, okay? So I totally accept uh, negative feedback and so on. And just remember this, I will be putting out these videos as and when uh, the thoughts mature in my mind. Uh, my first priority is to my clients. Uh, and um, and uh, I enjoy being criticized in order that I become sharper than you, okay? And then I'll also put up videos on what I think about the US, by the way. Uh, I spend a lot of, the time, a lot of time in the US uh, and there are reasons why we must not take the US for granted and I'll explain that uh, in a subsequent video. So thank you very much uh, and uh, I look forward to building a community uh, with whom I can discuss some of these issues uh, in a constructive way. And final point, uh, remember innovations in finance only ever takes place in times of crisis. That's the Bank of England story.